Hey everyone, this is Alpha Lance with the Leaderboard, and today we're here to help you figure out Warframe's lore, because let's face it, you're not really listening to those floating heads as you're slaughtering enemies and fiddling about with mods. But first, if you've never played Warframe before, there are going to be major spoilers for some of the most important quests in Warframe, the Second Dream, the War Within, and the Sacrifice. So if you have not finished those yet and are still worried about the spoilers, now is the time to pause the video. Alright, let's move on. <laughs> A long time ago, in a parallel galaxy not so far away, there was the Origin System, a constellation of stars and planets unlike our own. This system was ruled by a race of humanoids known as the Orican, or the Children of Light. Indeed, that's what they were. The Orican Empire was a shining star in the cosmos with a highly advanced race that created a seemingly perfect society. But like all such perfect societies, the Orican Empire was littered with crazy rules and morally suspect behavior. We've seen it happen in a Atlantis, Krypton, and the Truman Show. It's just not going to end well for anyone. They handed out harsh punishments for whoever dared to disobey them. Things looked good on the surface under their rule, but in reality, the Empire's actions had left their solar system in a deplorable state. Their solar system had all been terraformed and overpopulated, coupled with excessive experimentation had led to a shortage of resources. The Oricon decided it was too difficult to clean up their own star system, so the plan was just to find a new one and start over with it. Exactly the exact same thing happened to me when I saw a rat in my apartment. Eventually, the Oricon's explorations led them to the Void, an interdimensional place in space known to be a source of mysterious phenomena. Because of the Void's vast mysteries and unknown powers, the Oricon decided to keep poking it with a stick. Because what could possibly go wrong? They ran some experiments on the Void which resulted in advancements in technology. They discovered that it was also the way to a brand spanking new star system. It was agreed that this new star system, called Tau, would be developed to expand the Empire. But in order to colonize the Tau system, the Oricon had to develop a bunch of self-sustaining robots to terraform this new land. These robots had the ability to adapt to enemies and replicate from damaged components. Super convenient and zero maintenance cost? What could go wrong? All that was left to do was send some people across the void to Tau. You know, to give the place a more humanoid touch. The Zariman 10 ship was packed up with settlers and their families and was sent through the void and onward to Tau. Unfortunately, something went wrong with the jump, as it always does, and they ended up inside the void itself. The adults on the ship were driven mad and began slaughtering each other, while the children, however, remained immune to the madness caused by the void and banded together to protect themselves. The Zariman 10 was left floating in the void with the children until it eventually returned to the Orican Empire. The children were outwardly unchanged during their prolonged exposure, but they developed some uncontrollable powers and abilities. This race, named after the ship they came back on, were the Tenno. And these kids are the same Tenno race that you're playing in Warframe today. As I said before, spoilers. The Tenno were unable to control their void powers and ended up accidentally killing and mutilating anyone that came in contact with them. In response, the Orican locked them away like Hannibal Lecter. But due to possible childhood abandonment issues, one of the elite scholars, known as the Margulis, adopted the Tenno and brought them under her care. She began to work on channeling their powers and discovered that the children could control their abilities through dreams. This discovery eventually led to the early framework of transference. The Oricon sentenced Margulis to death for breaking the rules. She left behind a pretty pissed off husband, also known as Ballas the Executor, as well as a bunch of pissed off Tenno children. All of this is definitely coming back to bite them in the rear. But before I get ahead of myself, let's go back to the Tau star system where the terraforming is still going on. Remember all those great super advanced robots who would adapt and self-heal? Well, those advanced capabilities ensured that they quickly attain sentience, of course. And what's an advanced robot? that just gained super sentience going to do? Well, maybe start an uprising, obviously. If I've learned anything from the sci-fi genre, it's that the creation of advanced artificial intelligence will always lead to a revolution. And that is how the old war began. The sentient robots, now called sentients of course, took it upon themselves to protect the galaxy from the Orican colonization. They were angered by the way the Orican had messed up their own star system and predicted that Tau would probably suffer the same fate. The sentients led by the Hun Hao quickly began to overwhelm the Orican. The more advanced technology the Orican developed and threw at them, the greater the sentients were able to adapt to it. However, the Orican discovered that the sentients have a weakness to more archaic technology. In the Orican's desperation to beat the sentients, their bio-warfare experiments got a little out of hand. They created an all-consuming mutating horde known as the Infested, which acted like a biological virus to mutate and, as well as you might have guessed, infest its host. In fact, the original Warframes were Orican soldiers 
soldiers infected with a particular strain of the infested. However, these original Warframes were wild, unruly, and difficult to control. This biowarfare seemed to be effective against the sentients for a time, but eventually the sentients struck some heavy blows against the Orican. If only there was a race of strong, psychic children that could defend us. Well. What do you know? The transference technology that Margulis and Ballas created was adapted into a sort of mind control that allowed the Tenno to take control of a Warframe and channel their power. The Warframes could now be controlled and they were effective against the sentience, to say the least. As the saying goes, in times of peace, prepare for war. Remember how the Orican murdered Margulis, the wife of Ballas the Executor? Well, Ballas seized his opportunity to take revenge on the Empire. Ballas conspired with Hun Hao, leader of the sentience, and revealed the location of the reservoir, which is where the Tenno control their warframes from afar. It's pretty much like those human goo pods in the Matrix. The Tenno are left defenseless, and probably hairless, in their pods. Leading up to the end of the war, Hun Hao staged his death and left his daughter Nata as an agent in the Orican ranks. Nata was tasked with taking over the Tenno and destroying the Orican from within, while later reviving Hun Hao for the last big takeover. Hun Hao's death led to Orican throwing a great victory celebration to honor the Tenno, but it turned out to be some sort of red wedding debacle. Still holding a grudge over Margulis's execution, the Tenno slaughtered the seven Orican emperors. Everything was going according to Han Hao's plan, but Nata, having become emotionally attached to the Tenno, was unable to kill them. Knowing reviving her father would lead to their deaths, she left him to lie dormant at the bottom of the sea and changed her identity to the Lotus. After the fall of the Orican Empire, the solar system was left in chaos. Much like the battle for the Iron Throne, a number of factions began to rise out of the ashes. One of the Orican's many atrocities was the creation of the human clone slave race known as the Grenier. They held much anger against the Empire and began to unite under the rule of two outcast Orican girls known as the Twin Queens. With their band of loyal Grenier, they took advantage of the chaos to enact revenge against the Empire that cast them out in an event known as the Uprising. Next came the Corpus Faction, profiteers from the spoils of Remnant War. Created by mercantile guilds and smugglers, they banded together in a profit-driven cult religion. They adapted old and scattered Orican technology and controlled the commerce of the Origin system. And let's not forget as well about the infested, that weird biovirus that is still plaguing the system. Some Grenier scientists thought it was a good idea to experiment with them, but as I'm sure you might imagine, it was not a good idea. And so began hundreds of years of war. Now we're leaving the backstory and we're heading to present day Warframe lore. While the war between the factions has been going on, the Tenno have been sleeping soundly. But when you're the Tenno, it's only a matter of time before someone tries to kill you. The Grenier known as Captain Vor was put in charge of the execution of all sleeping Tenno. But as he tries to harvest their parts, he awakens you, the player character. I don't know about you, but I don't like when someone comes into my room. That also being said, if someone woke me up in the middle of the night, I probably wouldn't go at them with the katana either. It turns out in this time, Nata, aka the Lotus, has been going around waking up and protecting the Tenno. She's been sending them out on an endless series of missions in order to maintain the balance of power between the Grenier, Corpus, and the Infested. Following the events of the in-game quest, The Second Dream, Hun Hao is discovered deep inside Uranus while the Grenier accidentally digs him up. His body is long gone, but his consciousness lives on, allowing him to communicate with others whenever someone comes in contact with his remains. He discovers that his daughter Nata betrayed him and is set to accomplish his original mission, eliminate the Tenno. Let's be real though, a floating piece of consciousness shouldn't be really a threat to anyone. It's like a step or two below being a brain in a jar. But to be fair, this floating consciousness commands an army of sentience, so I guess that is pretty formidable. But it looks like Hun Hao's time spent in the depths of Uranus really helped to move his thoughts along. Literally. He manages to transfer his soul into a sword forged from his remains and enlists the help of one of the old Orican Empire's bodyguards. That's metal. United by their mutual hate for the Tenno, they vowed to destroy them all. The Stalker is the last surviving bodyguard of the old emperors. Using the knowledge that Hun Hao obtained from Balas all those years ago, he goes in search of the Womb of the Sky, the reservoir where the Tenno would be at their most vulnerable. Hun Hao, using a bit of his sentient devil magic on Lotus, discovers that she hid the reservoir on Earth's moon and then hid the moon in the void. I don't know how she even began to do that and what would happen to the moon's gravitational pull on Earth, but I guess that's just too many questions. The moon, now called Lua, is where your Tenno lies. It's also where you discover that you're not a badass in an awesome Warframe suit. You're an angsty teenager that controls the Warframe. There's a battle where your Warframe ends up holding your Tenno self, which seems a bit weird. Eventually, due to the stalker experimenting some form of space leg, the reservoir is not destroyed and you bring your own body home and defeat the stalker. Yay! 
Yay! No wait, it's Warframe. Let's not celebrate just yet. Now that your ageless and powerful Tenno body is within reach, it becomes a target for the Twin Queens. So going back to the Orican race, they were able to prolong their lifespan due to this process called continuity that essentially transferred a person's consciousness to another person's body. At the start of the war within Questline, we learn that the Queens have been using the Grenier to prolong their lifespan to replicate continuity. Because the Grenier are a bunch of clones, they have all sorts of terrible genetic issues that shorten their lifespan and cause a bunch of other problems. Certainly not the ideal new body for the Queens. The Elder Queen then realizes that an ageless Tenno with all sorts of void power sounds like a pretty awesome place for her to park her consciousness. The Elder Queen tricks Teshin, the old Dax soldier who runs the Conclave Arena, into doing her bidding. Compelled by the Queen's magic disco stick, how else would you describe the Kuba Scepter? Teshin steals your body for the Queen's use. The good thing about this whole transference thing is that you can sever your link with the Warframe and return to your ship, where your ship's consciousness, aka Ortis, probably tries to attack you. The day gets worse though, as you're left stranded without your Warframe and have to use your puny humanoid strength to walk around and fight off some terrifying cave mods. Gah! Those things are legitimately terrifying, and your lack of stamina and armor doesn't help either. In the end, you'll be happy to know that the Teshin helps remove the rest of the Elder Queen from your brain. After that, you go on to kill the Elder Queen, but of course, her sister, the Worm Queen, vows revenge on you. Now, even though you've killed the Elder Queen, the factions are still at war and the origin system still basically sucks. In the midst of meddling with all the different factions, you begin to hear rumors of some rage-like symptoms happening in one of the syndicates known as the Red Veil. If you think that sounds familiar to what happened with the Xamarin 10-0, well, you're not wrong. It turns out the source of all this rage was from one of the Tenno kids called Rel. The Red Veil, one of the game's most violent syndicate factions, found Rel and kept him with them. Like any violent extremist group worth their salt, the Veil eventually sacrificed Rel in a ritual that they believed would seal away the void entity known as the Man in the Wall. Rel's spirit was bound to this Warframe Harrow, thus the Chains of Harrow chapter. The Lotus believes that something has blocked Rel from his emotions, and as a result he's gone insane, causing his emotions to manifest in physical form. So by capturing Rel's lost emotions, which are now running about these murder scenes like weird ghosts, we're able to make Rel stop murdering people. Lotus seems completely dismissive of the man in the wall that Rel is scared of, but the thing is we can definitely see that there's someone else there. Rel is eventually free from his prison, while that's good for him, now there's no one fighting back the man of the wall, which could be a little bit of a problem. In the latest expansion of Warframe, the sentients have started waking up on Earth. Upon further investigation, we find bits of a Warframe that was apparently blown up while fighting the sentients. This Warframe, known as Umbra, explains that he was originally an Orican Dax soldier that was punished by Balas. Ah yes, Ballas, that double-crossing, transference-inventing Orican. Umbra discovered Ballas' betrayal and wanted to stop him, but before he could, Ballas exposed himself to the infested, forcing him to become a Warframe and affixing him with transference so that he had to obey Ballas. He then forced Umbra to kill his son. Not cool. Horrified by the story, we agree to take down Ballas together. But because the Lotus is thirsty AF, she stops you and takes Ballas back to her cave. Old flings, am I right? I mean, how could you, Lotus? What about mechs before pecs? Come on. Well, with or without the Lotus, the Tenno still need to keep balance in the solar system. And that's not the end, however, because look to the east, Nata is back. And she's gone through some faceless man training regiment because she is full sentient now. As if turning into a robot wasn't bad enough, she's been scolded by mommy for letting her father die and staying out too late and befriending a bunch of orphans. There's so much depth in the story and a lot more side quest action we couldn't even fit in here, but the highly complex lore is constantly getting updated, so we're looking forward to grinding to that next Warframe. And check out our video that unpacks what your Warframe main says about you. Once again, I'm Alpha Lance, and thanks for watching this video with the leaderboard, your home for video game facts.